364. The anchorite speaks. The art of associating with men rests essentially on one skillfulness, which presupposes long exercise in accepting a repast and taking a repast in the cuisine of which one has no confidence. Provided one comes to the table with the hunger of a wolf, everything is easy. The worst society gives the experience, as Mephistopheles says. But one has not always this wolf's hunger when one needs it. Alas, how difficult are our fellow men to digest. First principle, to stake one's courage as in a misfortune, to seize boldly, to admire oneself at the same time, to take one's repugnance between one's teeth, to cram down one's disgust. Second principle, to improve one's fellow man by praise, for example, so that he may begin to sweat out his self-complacency, for to seize a tuft of his good or interesting qualities, and pull at it till one gets his whole virtue out, and can put him under the folds of it. Third principle, self-hypnotism, to fix one's eye on the object of one's intercourse, as on a glass knob ceasing to feel pleasure or pain thereat. One falls asleep unobserved, becomes rigid, and acquires a fixed pose. A household recipe used in married life and in friendship, well tested and prized as indispensable, yet not scientifically formulated. Proper name is Patience. 365. The Anchorite Speaks One More. We have also intercourse with men. We also modestly put on the clothes in which people know us as such. Respect us and see. And we thereby mingle in society, that is to say, among the disguised who do not wish to be so called. We also do like all prudent masqueraders, and courteously dismiss all curiosity which has not reference merely to our clothes. There are, however, other modes and artifices for going about among men and associating with them. For example, as a ghost, which is very advisable when one wants to scare them and get rid of them easily. An example, a person grasps at us and is unable to seize us. That frightens him, or we enter by a closed door, or when the lights are extinguished, or after we are dead. The lights, the artifice of posthumous men par excellence. What? said such a one once impatiently. Do you think we should delight in enduring this strangeness, coldness, death stillness about us, all this subterranean, hidden, dim, undiscovered solitude which is called life with us, and might just as well be called death if we were not conscious of what will arise out of us? And that only after our death Shall we attain unto our life and become living, ah, very living, we posthumous men? Three sixty seven. How one has to distinguish, first of all, in works of art, everything that is thought, versified. 
painted and composed, yea, even built and molded, belongs either to monologic art or to art before witnesses. Under the latter, there is also to be included the apparently monologic art which involves the belief in God, the whole lyric of prayer. Because for a pious man there is no solitude, we, the godless, have been the first to devise this invention. I know of no profounder distinction in all the perspective of the artist than this. Whether he looks at his growing work of art, at himself, with the eye of a witness, or whether he has forgotten the world, as is the essential thing in all monologic art, it rests on forgetting. It is the music of forgetting. Three sixty eight. The cynic speaks. My objections to Wagner's music are physiological objections. Why should I therefore begin by disguising them under aesthetic formulae? My point is that I can no longer breathe freely when this music begins to operate on me. My foot immediately becomes indignant at it and rebels. For what it needs is time, dance and march. It demands first of all from music the ecstasies which are in good walking, striding, leaping and dancing. But do not my stomach, my heart, my blood and my bowels also protest? Do I not become a horse, unawares under its influence? And then I ask myself what my body really wants from music generally. I believe it wants to have relief, so that all animal functions should be accelerated by means of light, bold, unfettered, self-assured rhythm. So that brazen leaden life should be gilded by means of golden, good, tender harmonies. My melancholy would fain rest its head in the hiding places and abysses of perfection. For this reason I need music. What do I care for the drama? What do I care for the spasms of its moral ecstasies in which the people have their satisfaction? What do I care for the whole pantomimic hocus pocus of the actor? It will now be divined that I am essentially anti-theatrical at heart. But Wagner, on the contrary, was essentially a man of the stage and an actor, and the most enthusiastic mummer worshipper that has ever existed, even among musicians. And let it be said in passing that if Wagner's theory was that drama is the object, and music is only the means to it, his this, on the contrary, from beginning to end, has been to the effect that attitude is the object, drama, and even music can never be anything else but means to this. Music as a means of elucidating, strengthening, and intensifying dramatic poses, and the actors appeal to the senses, and Wagnerian drama only an opportunity for a number of dramatic attitudes. Wagner possessed, along with all other instincts, the dictatorial instinct of a great actor in all and everything, and as has been said, also as a musician. I once made this clear with some trouble to a thoroughgoing Wagnerian, and I had reasons for adding. Do be a little more honest with yourself. We are not now in the theater. 
In the theater we are only honest in the mass. As individuals we lie, we belie even ourselves. We leave ourselves at home when we go to the theater. We there renounce the right to our own tongue and choice, to our taste and even to our courage as we possess it and practice it within our own four walls in relation to God and man. No one takes his finest taste in art into the theater with them. Not even the artist who works for the theater. Their one is people, public, herd, woman, Pharisee, voting animal, Democrat, neighbor, and fellow creature. There, even the most personal conscience succumbs to the leveling charm of the great multitude. There, stupidity operates as wantonness and contagion. There, the neighbor rules. There, one becomes a neighbor. I have forgotten to mention what my enlightened Wagnerian answered to my physiological objections. So the fact is that you really are not healthy enough for our music. Three sixty nine juxtapositions in us. Must we not acknowledge to ourselves, we artists, that there is a strange discrepancy in us? That on the one hand our taste, and on the other hand our creative power Keep apart in an extraordinary manner, continue apart and have a separate growth I mean to say that they have entirely different gradations And tempi of age, youth, maturity, mellowness, and rottenness so that, for example, a musician could all his life create things which contradicted all that is ear and heart, spoiled for listening, prized, relished, and preferred. He would not even require to be aware of the contradiction, as an almost painfully regular experience shows. A person's taste can easily outgrow the taste of his power Even without the latter being thereby paralyzed or checked in its productivity The reverse, however, can also to some extent take place And it is to this especially that I should like to direct the attention of artists a constant producer, a man who is a mother in the grand sense of the term One who no longer knows or hears of anything except Pregnancies and childbeds of his spirit Who has no time at all to reflect and make comparisons with regard to himself and his work Who is also no longer inclined to exercise his taste but simply forgets it, letting it take its chance of standing, lying, or falling. Perhaps such a man at last produces works on which he is then quite unfit to pass a judgment. So that he speaks and thinks foolishly about them and about himself. This seems to me almost the normal condition with fruitful artists. Nobody knows a child worse than its parents, and the rule applies even to take an immense example to the entire Greek world of poetry and art, which was never conscious of what it had done. 370. What is romanticism. It will be remembered perhaps, at least among my friends, that at first I assailed the modern world with some gross errors and exaggerations, but at any rate with hope in my heart. I recognized who knows from what personal experiences 
the philosophical pessimism of the 19th century as the symptom of a higher power of thought, a more daring courage, and a more triumphant plenitude of life than had been characteristic of the 18th century, the age of Hume, Kant, Condillac, and the sensualists. So that the tragic view of things seemed to me the peculiar luxury of our culture, its most precious, noble, and dangerous mode of prodigality, but nevertheless, in view of its overflowing wealth, a justifiable luxury. In the same way I interpreted for myself German music as the expression of a Dionysian power in the German soul. I thought I heard in it the earthquake by means of which a primeval force had been imprisoned for ages was finally finding vent. Indifferent as to whether all that usually calls itself culture was thereby made to totter. It is obvious that I then misunderstood what constitutes the veritable character of both philosophical pessimism and German music, namely their romanticism, what is romanticism? Every art and philosophy may be regarded as a healing and helping appliance in the service of a growing, struggling life. They always presuppose suffering and sufferers. But there are two kinds of sufferers on the one hand. Those that suffer from overflowing vitality who need Dionysian art and require a tragic view and insight into life. And on the other hand, those who suffer from reduced vitality, who seek repose, quietness, calm seas, and deliverance from themselves through art or knowledge or else intoxication, spasm, bewilderness, and madness. All romanticism in art and knowledge responds to the twofold craving of the latter. To them Schopenhauer as well as Wagner responded and responds to name those most celebrated and decided romanticists who were then misunderstood by me, not, however, to their disadvantage, as may be reasonably conceded to me. Their being richest in overflowing vitality, the Dionysian god and man, may not only allow himself the spectacle of the horrible and questionable, but even the fearful deed itself and all the luxury of destruction, disorganization, and negation. With him, evil, senselessness, and ugliness seem, as it were, licensed in consequence of the overflowing plenitude of procreative, fructifying power, which can convert every desert into a luxuriant torch. Conversely, the greatest sufferer, the man poorest in vitality, would have most need of mildness, peace, and kindliness in thought and action. He would need, if possible, a god who is specially the god of the sick, a savior. Similarly, he would have need of logic, the abstract intelligibility of existence. For logic soothes and gives confidence. In short, he would need a certain warm fear dispelling narrowness and imprisonment within optimistic horizons. In this manner, I gradually began to understand Epicurus, the opposite of a Dionysian pessimist. In a similar manner, also the Christian only a type of Epicurean, and like him, essentially a Romanticist. And 
my vision has always become keener in tracing that most difficult and insidious of all forms of retrospective inference, which most mistakes have been made. The inference from the work to its author, from the deed to its doer, from the ideal to man who needs it. From every mode of thinking and valuing to the imperative want behind it. In regards to all aesthetic values, I now avail myself of this radical distinction. I ask in every single case, has hunger or superfluity become creative here? At the outset, another distinction might seem to recommend itself more. It is far more conspicuous. Namely, to have in view whether the desire for rigidity, for perpetuation, for being is the cause of the creating, or the desire for destruction, for change, for the new, for the future, for becoming. But when looked at more carefully, both these kinds of desire prove themselves ambiguous and are explicable precisely according to the before-mentioned and, as it seems to me, rightly preferred scheme. The desire for destruction, change, and becoming may be the expression of overflowing power, pregnant with futurity. My terminus for this is, of course, the word Dionysian. But it may also be the hatred of the ill-constituted, destitute, and unfortunate, which destroys and much destroy, because the enduring, yea, for all that endures, in fact all being, excites and provokes it. To understand this emotion, we have but to look closely at our anarchists. The will to perpetuation requires equally a double interpretation. It may on the one hand proceed from gratitude and love. Art of the origin will always be an art of apotheosis, perhaps to the rambic, as with Rubens, mocking divinely, as with Hafiz, or clear and kind-hearted, as with Goethe, spreading a Homeric brightness and glory over everything. In this case, I speak of Apollonian art. It may also be, however, the tyrannical will of a sorely suffering, struggling, or tortured being who would like to stamp his most personal, individual, and narrow characteristics, the very idiosyncrasy of his suffering as an obligatory law and constraint on others, who, as it were, takes revenge on all things in that he imprints, enforces, and brands his image, the image of his torture upon them. The latter is romantic pessimism in its most extreme form, whether it be as Schopenhauerian will philosophy or as Wagnerian music. Romantic pessimism, the last great event in the destiny of our civilization. That there may be quite a different kind of pessimism, a classical pessimism. This presentiment and vision belongs to me as something inseparable from me as my proprium and ipsissimum. Only that the word classical is repugnant to my ears. It has become far too worn, too indefinite and distinguishable. I call that pessimism of the future. For it is coming, I see it coming, Dionysian pessimism.